So I got a, I have a set of slides that hopefully I can help um, educate, uh, clarify uh, any of the questions that you may have regarding robotic surgery, what that is and how is that uh, something that uh, we do, why do we do, and what have you. Um, but yeah, as you see, so I'm, I'm the, currently the director of uh, robotic surgery at Peconic Bay, also currently the chairman of the medical board. Um, I've held various uh, governmental or, or uh, roles like that throughout my tenure at uh, Peconic Bay. Um, so here's uh, my little introduction. I've been in, a, in the East End uh, since 1999 when I finished my residency at St. Agnes in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, originally from uh, Harrison in Westchester County, uh, and then uh, uh, came back. When I came back to New York, I ended up in um, at uh, uh, Eastern Long Island here. Um, and since 1999, up until 2011, I uh, was a surgeon on staff at ELI, P uh, Peconic Bay or Central Suffolk at the time, and uh, Southampton Hospital. And up until 2013, I was uh, also at uh, Eastern Long Island Hospital. Uh, so an extended bit as I stopped practicing at Southampton Hospital in 2011, uh, but continued at ELI and PBMC. Um, and then since 2013, I'm operating only at uh, Peconic Bay at this time. Um, I currently live in Southampton, so getting out of Southampton is always easier than trying to get into Southampton, but the North Fork is becoming just as difficult as it is on the South Fork. Sorry, I had nothing to do with that, but <laughs> anyway, I share your pain. Um, so since, since I finished uh, my residency uh, and completed it in the late 90s, um, minimally invasive surgery was kind of uh, not new, but relatively uh, uncommon in most places. And, and certainly when I came here, I was um, probably more advanced than any other surgeon who had been here for a long time in terms in, in reference to minimally invasive surgery. Um, I put keyhole surgery there just to kind of put a layman's term to it. Um, in 2012, uh, hopefully I'll, I'll have you understand why I kind of went over to uh, robotic surgery. I had the capability, obviously, at Peconic Bay. Um, and it was sort of the next step in the evolution of minimally invasive surgery. Um, and since that time, I've uh, kind of certainly gone over my learning curve. I've become uh, a proctor for intuitive for robotic surgery. Uh, and to date, as of yesterday, uh, 1,364 cases uh, robotically. Uh, I've done since uh, 2012 when I first started doing it. Most of, most of what I do are probably inguinal and uh, ventral hernias, meaning anything in the um, anterior abdomen. Uh, incisional hernias, I do a fair number of hiatal hernias. That's where your stomach goes up into your chest. Certainly anything inside of the abdomen, including gallbladders, colons, uh, any other intestinal operations or anything inside of the uh, abdomen. Um, so in reference to the robot at Peconic Bay, let me first by start by saying that in 2000, the FDA approved uh, a robotic um, tool, uh, the Da Vinci robot, basically, by Intuitive. <clears throat> it's gone through a number of uh, 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 upgrades at that time. But in 2010, Peconic Bay acquired a da Vinci S robot, and the primary use for the robot at the time was either cardiac or prostates. And at the time, uh, Peconic Bay worked with a local urologist as well as a urologist from Columbia Presbyterian, where uh, we had a visiting surgeon come and do a number of robotic procedure, procedure prostatectomies per month. So in 2012, uh, well, in 2010, when I saw the robot here and recognized well, I can use that because I figured uh, for, for some of the complex laparoscopic stuff that I do, the robot would make it a little easier. And I'll, I hope I kind of uh, show you why. So in 2012, uh, there was an upgrade to the Da Vinci robot um, that allowed uh, me to uh, become part of uh, uh, one of the, uh, the surgeons using the robotic platform. And that was uh, one particular procedure was a robotic single site um, 
procedure done for gallbladders. So it was an FDA approved uh, new uh, concept for Intuitive to have uh, gallbladder surgery and um, GYN surgery, hysterectomies, for instance, to be done just through a port that went into the umbilicus with a belly button. And so that's when I started my robotic uh, uh, career. Um, and then with that, I kind of moved on to doing anything I did minimally invasive to uh, uh, up until this point, uh, and then just transferring that technique to moving on to doing everything robotically. Um, in 2017, we had, we up upgraded again, we have the latest Da Vinci XI. Um, and the advancement of that is uh, how do you approach the patient with the arms? It just makes it a lot easier in the whole scheme of how the operating room is set up. Um, and uh, currently we use it for general surgery, colorectal surgery, gynecology, thoracic, and urology. Um, other, other fields where uh, they use robotics is cardiac. We don't do cardiac surgery at Peconic, um, but um, uh, another one would be even ear, nose, and throat. Um, so, uh, but for right now, the, the, the largest of uh, robotic procedures are done uh, with the urologists. Um, and then the upcoming fields where there's a sharp inclination of uh, use is general surgery and thoracic surgery. So traditionally open operations were how we ended up taking care of surgical diseases. So say you had an appendicitis or you had um, something going on with your intestines or what have you, it would be an open operation. And that's where surgeons got their hands in. Uh, you relied on the light surrounding kind of focusing in and using retractors to kind of um, see where you have to see in, in the crevices without getting too gory. I'll just put it at that. Um, but as we, as we moved on and progressed in surgery, minimally invasive surgery became something uh, of an entity in the uh, 80s, um, first with gallbladder surgery and some GYN uh, surgeons. Um, and in the, in the 90s, it became very typical to do gallbladder surgery through uh, uh, small incisions, laparoscopy. Um, and then as the 90s kind of progressed, surgeons started doing more laparoscopically, whether it was colon surgery, hernia surgery, anything in the abdomen. Uh, the, lap, the laparoscopy signifies anything in the abdomen. So for orthopedics, it would be arthroscopy. So it's using a scope inside uh, a joint space. So that's the arthroscopy bit of it. But laparoscopy uh, is anything inside of the abdomen. And so in doing so, it became a little bit challenging for surgeons as we use these long instruments on the bottom right there. And you can see the surgeon, the surgeons in each of these pictures <clears throat> kind of have their hands at their side um, over a patient where these little tubes are in the abdomen. And with these instruments kind of grabbing, cutting, uh, suturing, et cetera. And it's uh, relying on a camera in the abdomen that creates a two-dimensional picture that's shown on the screen, either across the surgeon or somewhere in the room and so forth. So some of the challenges with that, and I mean, you can see the posture of the surgeon on the top right, where his neck is kind of bent backwards and so forth. Um, it becomes a little uh, ergonomically challenging uh, over long cases and so forth because of the contortion of your, <laughs> as, you, as you operate on a patient, of how you kind of move around and so forth. And, and it's also was very challenging in that it was a three-dimensional anatomy that you're operating on translated to a two-dimensional screen and understanding the depth of where your instrument needs to be, where what's inside of the abdomen. Um, so kind of kind of translating that three-dimensional space into that two-dimensional screen and kind of understanding. So there were some surgeons that were better at laparoscopy than others uh, because uh, oftentimes as you're going to grab something laparoscopically, you'll see surgeons grab in the air and then realize, oh no, I have to grab a little deeper or so or a little bit further back. Um, and so it's a little bit of that. And so 
it became a little challenging then to kind of do laparoscopic surgery. Open surgery was kind of get your hands in there, you feel, you can see, and you, the light on the inside became the difficult part of open surgery. And then certainly you worry about the bleeding and uh, injuring stuff around you. So it wasn't, it was challenging. Um, so the question was going to be, do we continue with a, what was easier with an open incision uh, operation, or do you move on something more minimally invasive where the patients will benefit afterwards? And so um, as, as the evolution of the robots came, it was recognized that, uh, oh yeah, so we can do these minimally invasive operations without having to contort our bodies and so forth. And it enabled us to kind of do uh, what we would do either through an open technique or a minimally invasive technique, but a lot easier. And so uh, as I have this picture of robots here, you kind of think, well, all right, if the robots are coming and they're gonna invade and so forth, but we could talk about automated robots and non-automated robots. So automated robots are robots that you kind of press a button, it, the Roomba, for instance, will go around the room and kind of figure out and map in its, uh, in, in its, in its algorithms of where to go and so forth as it just kind of crisscrosses all across the room. And it automatically vacuums every inch uh, that it can, can do on, the, um, on, on your floors. Uh, the same thing with the, the window cleaner as well. Um, or automated rat robots would be something like a drone that you pick point A to point B and it figures out the airspace that it needs to travel to kind of go there. So you push a button and you set, the set it on its way and it goes on. That is not what robotic surgery is, at least not yet. It's not. So robotic surgery is not automated. Robotic surgery still requires the surgeon to sit behind the console, which is the top right picture there, um, that has the pedals on the floor and joysticks, or you put your fingers in these little joysticks in that little box. So the surgeon's arm elbows are on that, uh, that uh, the stand in the front there. And there, as our elbows are resting on top of that, we have our hands in the joysticks and moving in that space controlling the arms of the robot, which is the bottom picture there. And each of those arms is connected to an instrument that goes through a tube that's placed into the abdomen. And so with that, we're able to um, uh, do laparoscopic surgery, but now sitting behind a console. Um, and, uh, and I'll go into the next slide here where we talk about uh, some of the clear advantages of robotic surgery. So I make an analogy of when I first got my glasses in third grade, and as much as I'll look up in the sky before I got my glasses, I said, oh yeah, there's these little green shimmering things on the trees, uh, those are leaves. And then when I walked out, when I first got my glasses and I looked up, and then that was the first time I saw the definition of what a leaf really looks like shimmering on a tree. And so that same, that same feeling that I had back in third grade with my new glasses was the same feeling I had when I stuck my head into the console. I could see things much more clear than I had ever seen them before. As much as uh, some of the laparoscopic stuff is, is, um, was high definition, et cetera, it wasn't 4K at the time yet, but it is currently 4K. The, the amount of clarity that um, is visualized looking through the camera um, uh, from behind the console of the robot is much more clear. There's such detail that you can see it's, it's tremendous. And so the high definition imagery uh, created a clear advantage uh, for, for that in one aspect. The other is um, sort of looking at through the camera, uh, the bottom right picture, you recognize that there are two lenses and then there's a light Kind of going around the circular bit of it. Um, so that creates stereo vision. And in doing so, you get the 3D imagery. So I put the picture of the guy with the red and blue glasses there, because you may remember going to the movie theaters and wearing uh, those glasses for 3D movies and so forth. Um, but the 3D vision sort of took away that um, trans translation of a three-dimensional three anatomy on a two-dimensional screen. All of a sudden, you see everything 3D. So the surgeon's first move to grab something is very pointed, very accurate. Um, and then that, that certainly created a situation where 
uh, it's recognized that oh yeah this makes this makes life a lot a lot easier and and the other bit of it is the instruments the instruments themselves are wristed so what i mean by wristed is at the end of the instrument laparoscopic instruments would just kind of open and close and maybe turn 360 degrees wristed instruments means that they can turn, bend around corners, just like your hands can. And so as much as that may not seem like much of an advantage, it is a clear advantage uh, when you're operating uh, certainly around blood vessels, certain structures and what have you. Um, and so altogether, the visualization, the three-dimensional imagery, and then the wristed instruments translated into uh, the ability of surgeons uh, being able to do some advanced uh, minimally invasive surgery. The, the, the challenge of, again, that two-dimensional screen and three-dimensional anatomy pretty much was taken away. So I do this with uh, um, high school students at the local uh, Riverhead High School. They have a robots club. I haven't done it since 2019, but they would bring their robot and I would set the robot up, the surgical robot up for them. And we do little challenges, but it's amazing as you see anybody getting behind the console and start putting rings on top of cones or what have you, it happens very automatically. So it's, it's, very, it's very intuitive, pardon the pun. So different types of uh, specialties that uh, we do, uh, robotic surgery, achalasia is an esophageal, esophageal uh, stricture at the end of it, bladder cancer, colorectal, uh, and those, all those that are listed there. So pretty much all operations uh, in the abdomen uh, or in the body can be done uh, robotically. Uh, and again, if, if not an open incision to try to do things minimally invasive, uh, robotics has uh, enabled surgeons to do that. So some of the headlines uh, for uh, robotics, we do uh, using robots in the human eye. Uh, 2017, using a robotic drill to kind of figure out how deep into the skull to drill in for, for times, 50 times faster. So as it says there, 2017, also for rectal cancer, uh, better recovery of uh, the urogenital organs. And um, then the, I put 2016, the uh, coming age of telesurgery. So telesurgery is something that... Um, allows surgeons to uh, proctor or operate in a remote distance uh, away from uh, the, uh, 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 where the patient is. Um, and so with all of this stuff with robotics, you kind of say, well, where are, where are we going with all of this? And you realize, well, a lot of this is gonna kind of mix with artificial intelligence and uh, perhaps um, a lot of the data that's collected from various robotic surgery uh, may potentiate the ability to automate some of the things that we do currently with, uh, with uh, robotics. Um, and so uh, the last line I have there is uh, with robosurgeons, uh, you think about self-driving cars and you think about the legal and ethical uh, headaches about, uh, about some of that stuff. Um, it, I think it'll happen. I think there'll be a time where a lot of this stuff will be automated, um, but I think we're far enough away from. So, um, but I, I would say probably in the next 20 years, uh, perhaps. Um, so again, going back to telesurgery, telesurgery is just uh, performing surgery with robotic tools, uh, but in a remote uh, area. We're not currently doing telesurgery at Peconic Bay. We're doing uh, robotic surgery where it's high hard all the pieces of the robot are hardwired together where we're able to um, uh, do the operation right adjacent to the bed uh, of where the patient is under anesthesia uh, but uh, just some of the things to come uh, that I think as time goes on uh, would be one of these uh, telesurgery where you can have uh, say a specialist who's done a million of certain procedure and you're doing it somewhere, they can kind of chime in and help with uh, the, the guidance of, uh, of that procedure. So Dr. Jax uh, Maresco, he did uh, in 2001, he started uh, you playing around with this, but uh, some of the stuff is still being done in the military and uh, with NASA, but uh, currently it's not common practice in uh, uh, everyday hospitals in the world. 
So again, uh, advancement uh, for telesurgery would be that you would have an expert surgeon somewhere kind of proctoring another surgeon somewhere else uh, in terms of doing things. And I only put that there just because talking about the future of where some of uh, the advantages of robotic surgery can, uh, can enable surgeons to do. Um, some of the, so some of the difficulties with, with telesurgery, I'll just I'll make this my last bit of what I'll talk about with telesurgery is, is there is a lag period from if you're remotely somewhere and you're operating on a patient in Africa, say, um, there's a lag period for the signal to get transmitted far away. And if it's more than milliseconds, then it certainly can become catastrophic. But some of this stuff is being overcome uh, mostly because of what's happened in the gaming in industry and online gaming in that uh, essentially uh, creating uh, parallel networks to kind of uh, keep the flow uh, and, and sort of minimize the lag period. Um, it becomes uh, probably more important if you're on Mars and being operated on by a surgeon in the U.S. The lag might be uh, a few hours. So um, yeah, I don't think I would want to have my appendix out on Mars by a surgeon in the U.S. Uh, or on Earth. But uh, but anyway, this these are things that are kind of currently being looked at as well. So the Da Vinci uh, robot continue, uh, contains these components on the left and the first and second pictures are basically the control arms that hold the instruments. And that is draped in sterile drapes uh, by the patient's bedside. We set this up as the patient's under anesthesia. We wheel this in and kind of um, uh, put the instruments in through tubes that we had placed into the patient's abdomen. We use carbon dioxide to kind of tent the abdomen up under while well, the patient's under anesthesia. Um, and then we move over to the third picture there, which is the console. Console, just like I pointed out earlier, is just <clears throat> the control stick of, uh, of the robot. There's a visor in the middle where our head is placed into. The pedals on the bottom will control the camera using energy devices like electric cautery, et cetera. Um, and then the, the last piece of it is all the way on the right. And that's sort of the brains where everything gets plugged into um, uh, to enable this whole work. So everything that you see here is hardwired and connected together. So there's no lag period in terms of uh, controlling the instruments. So it, it enables traditional open surgery to perform, be performed minimally invasive. Um, and it enhances uh, the proper techniques for certain operations. Certainly cancer is one of them. Um, there are certain definitions that, uh, or, or anatomical uh, definitions that you want when you're operating, um, uh, understanding the, the anatomical planes. And when it comes to cancer, it's understanding the lymph nodes and how to get to it and operate on them without injuring surrounding structures. For some of the more difficult operations that uh, some surgeons can do laparoscopically, uh, but otherwise would choose to do it through an open incision, robotics has kind of leveled the playing field so that you can do these more difficult operations through minimally invasive techniques. <clears throat> so uh, less blood loss, the manipulation of the tissue is gentler as you can kind of recognize how much tension, because you can see the definition a lot clearer. Um, and that translates into less post-operative pain, quicker recovery for the patient, where um, even for gallbladders, uh, uh, looking at patients who underwent a laparoscopic gallbladder removal versus a robotic gallbladder removal, um, anecdotally, I recognize that there's a little less post-operative pain at the sites where the instruments go through in uh, robotic uh, uh, patients, uh, patients who undergone robotic surgery versus laparoscopic surgery. Um, and then the other bit of it, one, probably one of the main reasons why I ended up transitioning everything I did to robotics was the ergonomics. Um, so uh, doing a lot of laparoscopic surgery throughout my career, recognizing my lower back was starting to hurt, my neck was starting to hurt, as I translated a lot of what I did into robotics, um, I no longer have back pain like I did. Uh, my neck doesn't bother me so much anymore. So perhaps that'll allow me to operate for a longer period of time 
um, and uh, do more more things. So the ergonomics become uh, have become uh, an important part of uh, uh, for uh, for robotic surgeons and cer certainly personally for me. Um, and the other the other one of the other big reasons is pain afterwards. As we said, this is a uh, uh, most patients have a lot less pain. Uh, going through a robotic procedure versus an open procedure or even a laparoscopic procedure. And, uh, you know, in looking at these slides, as much as uh, I've, I've kind of done this talk before with um, uh, various other libraries and talked about the opiate uh, avoidance or trying to avoid opiates, op uh, pain used to be the uh, one of the main vital signs uh, in the uh, late 2000 and uh, say 2007 to 2010, where doctors were being um, reprimanded if they weren't treating pain well enough and if they weren't prescribing enough uh, medications. And now fast forward to you know things recently, certainly uh, you recognize that, uh, yeah, the opiate uh, problem uh, in, this, in, in the community has, is significant. Um, so a number of overdoses, a lot of most people who are addicted to um, opiates or addicted to uh, um, yeah, opiates have it they usually started out by somebody being prescribed opiates. Um, and so I go into this uh, mostly because since uh, for I'd say for the past uh, four years or so, uh, recognizing that uh, uh, prescribing postoperative pain medicines, um, has become a problem. Certainly uh, now it's uh, the tides have changed saying that we shouldn't be prescribing this stuff. Um, uh, robotics has become an important part of how to help manage some of the pain post-operatively. Um, and uh, for, the last, for the last three years or so, I haven't prescribed opiates, uh, or I haven't had the need to prescribe opiates for patients uh, after robotic surgery. Um, yeah, this, this slide just basically says that, yeah, most prescriptions or most uh, overdoses start out with prescriptions from physicians. Uh, all right, another, another uh, thing that kind of uh, drove uh, surgical recovery um, along with robotics is uh, kind of uh, what's been called ERAS or enhanced recovery after surgery. And, that, and that's discussing a, a few things that happened. Uh, one, uh, one is understanding the expectations of surgery beforehand, so it's having discussions, um, trying to say we can do this stuff minimally invasive and hope for a pain-free uh, surgery, although all surgery is not pain-free, but it can, ma can make it less painful. Um, understanding the harmful effects of the narcotics and, the, and just understanding how do we deal with uh, uh, recovery afterwards? Recognizing that, uh, yeah, we don't want to starve people after having abdominal surgery. We want to start feeding them uh, a little bit earlier and that kind of puts in motion how we recover a little bit faster. Uh, understanding um, how do we control uh, nausea from anesthesia, et cetera. Um, and then various different types of uh, uh, local anesthesia blocks and so forth. So. Going back now, now I'm going back into the robotics part of it. Uh, personally, for me, when in 2012 I started doing this stuff through a single site at the uh, belly button, and the top picture here on the right is the instruments all focusing in through a port that's placed through the belly button. Uh, there's an incision that's made inside of the belly button, um, and an opening that is about 2.5 centimeters or smaller. And through that, the instruments kind of come in, focus through that. Um, and enable uh, the operation to be performed uh, through one incision. The lower picture is a, uh, a woman who has a little scar there at her belly button, but basically she had uh, gallbladder surgery through uh, a little belly button incision. Um, and so I, I was the first on Long Island to do this uh, procedure in 2012 and, um, and probably still am the most experienced single site uh, robotic surgeon on Long Island. Um, uh, currently, I do a whole mixture of things, not only single site robotic surgery, but uh, uh, with multiple um, instruments as well. This is the new generation of the uh, single uh, site uh, uh, intuitive robot, where the cylinder that these instruments are poking out of is a 2.5 centimeter diameter. So 
again, going through the belly button through a 2.5 centimeter incision, basically uh, the curvilinear uh, length of your belly button. Um, this instrument can be placed in the abdomen and then the camera and the other instruments sort of um, have this configuration. And with that, you're, you then have three instruments plus a camera um, and uh, the capability of performing an operation uh, uh, robotically. Uh, so just currently this is approved only for prostates. Um, and this has been uh, become uh, more popular in the last year. It's been out for a couple of years now. Um, and on Long Island, there is one at um, uh, LIJ. And uh, then the other, there's a couple of them down in Manhattan at NYU and at Lenox Hill. Uh, but uh, this is kind of the next step in the evolution of robotic surgery is um, uh, poten potentially doing most operations just through the belly button uh, and so forth. So uh, for me, uh, it was uh, hernias uh, that kind of uh, become my dominant uh, bit of what I do. Um, so when we talk about hernias, um, talk about ventral hernias, where in the front, inguinal hernias being the most common type of hernias, uh, and then hiatal hernias. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, this stuff uh, as I move along. Um, so in transitioning uh, some of this to um, hernias and uh, uh, my capabilities that I've been able to provide patients um, for, uh, using uh, robotics. So a couple of things about uh, hernias that are rumor, rumors saying that hernias are caused by uh, heavy lifting or I can't do my work because I have a hernia or um, I've only had it for a short period of time or uh, her all hernias cause pain. So this, this can't be a hernia that I have bulging out of my abdomen or potentially that they go away. So they, these are the myths or the rumors of hernias. And what's the truth about it is hernias um, can, uh, what happens with a hernia is it can develop from an increase of abdominal pressure or it can worsen a hernias. Hernias are not likely affected by your daily activities, meaning that you can continue to work and do most of what you normally would do, unless obviously you're having a lot of pain or some other uh, uh, effect is, uh, is occurring. Um, hernia is, is essentially a wear and tear over time. So I uh, frequently make a, an analogy of a tire and an inner tube. Whereas if you have uh, a wear or tear or a hole in the tire, the inner tube kind of bulges outwards. So in a similar uh, scenario, it's the tendon of the abdomen that has that wear and tear. And then the inner lining of the abdomen can protrude through and potentially uh, incarcerate intestines, et cetera. Um, hernias can be a hereditary, so you frequently hear, oh yeah, my dad had a hernia, or uh, my mother, or my sister, etc. cetera. Um, and hernias can be painless, meaning that you don't always have to have uh, pain from a hernia. And they do not go on away on their own. There's nothing you can do, even if you said, I'm going to just strengthen my abdominal muscles. It, doesn't it will not uh, make a hernia go away. So this is a, just a couple of uh, images of natural belly button hernias. So as a, an infant, um, and, uh, and then on the right is uh, Juan Barreto Loesma, who was uh, Mr. Universe, I think in 1969. And I put that picture there too, because he was a Mr. Universe and he had this big old uh, umbilical hernia there. And, and that's to say that, uh, yes, you can, you can still lift and you can still do which you normally would do in your daily activities instead, as well as become Mr. Universe <laughs> with an umbilical hernia. Um, but you have to, you have to kind of realize that uh, it's not going to go away despite lifting and despite building up your abdominal muscles. So different types of hernias um, in this picture here, uh, this is a, up above is an epigastric hernia. These are natural places where you can develop hernias. Uh, you can have an umbilical hernia, the inguinal or the femoral, and then certainly if you've had any incisions on your abdomen that uh, potentially can uh, develop into an incisional hernia. Um, so a hernia is essentially a weakness of the abdominal wall that uh, lets something from the inside protrude outwards. Um, and, and the greatest uh, fear that we have is that a loop of uh, intestines will protrude through a hernia and get stuck. 
So hernias follow natural openings in the abdomen. The, we'll go back to the umbilicus or the belly button, for instance. Way back when, when your belly button cord or your umbilical cord was cut and retracts backwards, there's always a tiny opening there that with time can open even further. And then normally you'll have uh, fatty tissue lining the uh, upper abdomen kind of protruding through it until the hole gets large enough that you potentially can have intestines uh, coming through there. Um, so uh, trauma is another source of hernia. And obviously, I don't know if this guy developed a hernia, but certainly um, I would say that hurts. <laughs> The other thing that we kind of know with hernias is that hernias don't occur just because you're doing a lot of heavy activity, as this study sort of demonstrated um, that the greatest uh, cause of pressure in the abdomen is probably from coughing uh, and sneezing more than um, uh, running up and down the stairs or, or uh, uh, lifting heavy objects, etc. So a little bit about the anatomy of the abdomen, um, various tendons of the abdomen and, uh, and muscles kind of, uh, as muscles join muscles, they turn to tendons, or as muscles join bones, you turn to tendons. On the bottom of the left of this screen is, I attempted to draw what an inguinal hernia would look like as a, the inner lining of the abdomen protruding outside of an opening in the abdominal tendon. So inguinal hernias are probably the most common types, or they are the most common type of hernias. Uh, they certainly occur in males more to females, uh, but it is also the most common type of hernias in a female. Females will have uh, more commonly a femoral hernia if there's a femoral hernia. And that uh, is one that happens a little bit lower down in the groin that follows the blood vessels that go from uh, down your leg from the inside of the abdomen. So the question is, do you fix all hernias or do you not fix all hernias? Um, and the answer is, uh, you don't always have to fix a hernia. It all depends on uh, the situation, but um, uh, you, it's realized that the risk of delay of surgery increases the risk of incarceration or strangulation. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, certainly if you have a hernia that's hurting and you can't do certain activities because of it, uh, that's going to probably lead you to having it fixed uh, um, more uh, more readily. Um, so, so some of this is that you can still function uh, with a hernia, uh, but certainly with time, you won't see it go away. You'll see it increase in size. And at which point is it a time to fix it? And it's, I tell patients, it's a, it's a point of convenience. As long as you're not having a lot of limiting pain, it's a point of convenience. Um, when, when the season's slow, or when the timing's right, um, it's probably a good idea to fix it. And because uh, if you don't fix it, it'll potentially have a problem where you can't electively try to do these things. Um, and so uh, that discussion uh, happens. And certainly that's probably... Uh, the most common reason why I see patients in the office are for uh, inguinal hernias. Uh, different types of hernias, uh, moving into the minimally invasive procedures down the lower part of uh, this list here, the upper uh, four are open techniques for hernia repairs. Um, and the, the open techniques started out with just trying to suture the openings together. Um, that led to about a 10 to 20% chance of a hernia coming back just with the suture techniques and long uh, recoveries as well. And then moving on to the minimally, minimally invasive techniques. Um, and certainly what I do now is robotic. The recovery period is uh, a lot quicker and a lot less discomfort. So I typically tell patients that um, consider a two week period where you don't have to be somewhere, but for the most part um, uh, in a week's time, you can function uh, probably at about 70% uh, what your function was uh, prior to having the surgery. And then by two weeks time, I'd say you're pretty much 90% back to doing most of your activities. So then, you know, you talk about mesh and hernia, I think um, that will kind of go in a hand in hand discussion. There's various different types of mesh uh, for hernia. So why do I talk about mesh? Because we know if you fix hernias without mesh or without some sort of a reinforcement um, and, and trying to approximate tissue that's been separated, creating tension, and that's the suturing technique, that's where you'll have the increased risk of uh, uh, recurrence, where the tissues will separate despite the type of suturing you've done. 
Um, and so mesh has become an important part of it. So originally mesh was introduced in the 70s uh, for uh, hernias. And then uh, certainly uh, the evolution of mesh and, and so forth is still occurring, I would say. Uh, for the most part, what we use now has been tried and true for, for the 20 years that I've been uh, operating or so. Uh, and I use the same material. I use a poly, I personally use a polyester mesh for, for my patients because I know that uh, it will uh, leave less discomfort in the prolonged period uh, where the ideal situation is they don't even feel that there's anything there. It, it reinforces the tissues to prevent a hernia from coming back um, and, um, and enables me to do place it in, in places that um, I know the, it's going to be a lot less pain in the recovery. And then certainly moving that to laparoscopic and then robotic, um, it really kind of is recognized that, uh, yeah, we can, we can get you back on your feet and going back to, to all your activities a lot faster. And in the long run, you know, you'll forget about me and that you ever had a hernia. Uh, that would be the goal. Um, so as the mesh evolution continues, and certainly you hear some bad things about mesh, all I would say is that when you have raw mesh, think of it like a screen on your window. When you have it up against uh, an organ that will naturally kind of move, say the intestines or around the esophagus as you swallow or the urethra as you urinate, if you put a mesh against an organ that kind of slides, it, it almost acts as a sandpaper so you can develop an erosion and so forth. And so what robotics has enabled me to do is peel the layers apart, play, reinforce so the openings closed, reinforce by placing a mesh within the layers, closing them, and then this way sort of hiding the mesh inside of the abdominal wall having the advantage that that hernia is not likely to come back again. And also the advantage that that mesh is not likely to cause an erosion into the intestines or other organs around it. Um, and that's something that uh, I couldn't do laparoscopically just because of the difficulty, because of the instrumentations uh, of trying to do this, uh, doing it robotically, it really has enabled me to, to do things that um, I would only otherwise have to do through open incisions. Um, so different techniques, uh, the Lichtenstein repair is where mesh uh, was first introduced into fixing hernias and so forth. And there's various types of uh, mesh that are used uh, to try to, to try to do this. And the one thing that using mesh kind of recognized, allowed us to recognize is that the recurrence rates of hernias really went down and then it went down to less than 1% of the time. And so uh, that, that moved us on to using mesh and doing laparoscopic uh, procedures, but that kind of arose from a uh, Reeves, Dr. Reeves and Dr. Stopa did a technique early in the 60s or in the mid 60s where they would get in between the muscle layers through an open incision and kind of lay this big span of mesh across the lower abdomen and that would kind of prevent their, it's like putting an opening in the tire to put a patch between the tire and the inner tube and then trying to close the tire. Uh, and that's essentially what this was. And then that moved on to uh, then laparoscopy where uh, through small incisions allowing us to do that same uh, procedure, putting the patch on the inside of the tire, so to speak. So again, the robotic uh, capabilities of the three-dimensional, the clear imagery, um, the wristed instruments, and um, uh, the ergonomic bit of the surgeon sitting behind the console uh, create an advancement and certainly that became evident as patients were feeling better after having uh, some major operations, um, in particular for me, for, for hernias and for anything else I do in the abdomen. So uh, doing this, uh, these operations minimally invasively uh, translated into less pain, uh, quicker recovery uh, for inguinal hernias, uh, easily fix both sides at the same time, if in case uh, you have another hernia on that side. Um, and uh, so I would say probably about uh, 20 to 30% of the time, I incidentally find another hernia on the, uh, on the opposite side. And then certainly part of that discussion I have in the office prior to surgery is that if I see evidence of what looks to be a hernia on that other side, I can go ahead and repair it without additional discomfort afterwards, recovery, et cetera. Uh, so if anything, it prevents you from coming back to me in a couple of years with a hernia on that side. Um, so again, the uh, uh, 
this is one study that came out of the um, uh, American Hernia Society Quality Collaborative, which I, I uh, placed some of my uh, data into also. Um, and it really showed that there was a shorter length of stay, particularly for the larger hernias. Um, so I'll show you some pictures and so or, uh, some uh, a CAT scan in particular of a really large hernia that um, it almost looks like a, a volleyball is sticking out of a patient's abdomen. And that stuff I can do robotically as opposed to a big incision, a longer recovery period. Uh, you worry about wound infection with open incisions, et cetera. So for me, it certainly is recognized. And, and I think uh, this study kind of showed also that the, uh, some of these bigger hernias uh, can provide less hospital stay, less discomfort and recovery afterwards. Uh, so again, going back to these various hernias, um, talk about laparoscopic hernia, where in 1992 is where we just started doing some of these hernias laparoscopically. I was fortunate to be in a training program that did a lot of laparoscopic hernias. Otherwise, uh, most training programs at the time in reference to laparoscopy was just gallbladders. And then certainly um, nowadays we do everything pretty much laparoscopically as we possibly can. Um, a couple of other things that uh, were important is that uh, if you have a, a hernia, it's, a, it's, a, it's an opening that develops of the fascia or the tendon of the abdomen. It's important to try to close it and then reinforce it uh, with a mesh. Um, and, that, and that translates into uh, um, a more functional abdominal wall. Like I had a patient today who I had fixed uh, a number of months ago who said, hey, for the first time, I can lift my head straight up out of bed, where for years with a big hernia, he had to turn to his side and use the muscles on the side of his abdomen uh, to lift his head out of the bed. Um, and, and that's the functional abdominal wall. Most of what we take for granted a lot, but uh, it's really recognized when uh, you see some of these larger hernias. Um, so again, some of the principles of uh, hernias is, is kind of how to fix them, uh, closing the defect, kind of uh, placing a uh, uh, mesh in place. Um, so, you know, with laparoscopy, we have to use these various tacks and sutures to kind of hold the mesh in place on the anterior abdominal wall. There's a number of tacks that will be placed around that mesh to kind of rivet it to the abdominal wall that eventually the the tacks uh, nowadays are dissolvable, um, but in the recovery uh, after uh, surgery for laparoscopic hernia repair, um, that became uh, pretty much a, a very painful event. Um, and so as, that, as I moved on to robotics and started peeling the layers apart and placing a mesh in there that I don't need to tack and suture because, uh, because I'm closing it within the layers and also using a type of mesh that has like a Velcro property, a lot of people will come back to function uh, within a week's time. Uh, so there's a lot less discomfort. So again, the, the robotic capability has enabled uh, me to perform op big operations uh, and allow patients to come back to uh, their normal activities a lot faster. Uh, this, this slide basically just kind of points out that, yeah, that even, if you, even if you have low risk otherwise, if you're a smoker, obese, or diabetic, you have a chance of um, uh, complications developing from hernia repair and so forth. So there are certain things that we look at before patients undergoing surgery, make sure that their diabetes is under control. Um, if they're smoking and we try to get them to stop smoking, I will say for some of these big uh, uh, hernia repairs that I do, um, where if they failed, it's devastating. I won't do it until they stop smoking. Um, and so that's some of the conversations that we have in the office is uh, that yet, yeah, if you continue to smoke, you're at a high risk of a recurrence uh, from the data that we understand with this. So if, if, if we're gonna fix this hernia that's failed five times before, um, this technique will, will, will fix that the best possible way. But if you're still smoking, I'm gonna have you stop smoking um, prior to doing it. Otherwise, I'm not gonna do it. Uh, some of this, uh, just uh, the dynamics, if you look at diagram A would be normal, diagram B uh, would be if you had a hernia and the opening kind of stretches, that allows the whole side wall of the abdomen to kind of bellow outwards. 
So in, in the upper arrow in C, we like to bring those edges back together again. And sometimes it almost can act like a corset, if, especially if the opening is wide, say wider, wider than uh, maybe about eight centimeters or so, trying to just sew it back together again, uh, uh, creates almost like a corset where there's a high risk that that will expand and, and rip apart. And so one technique that, uh, that surgeons have developed is in the lower in D is we're getting the midline back to the middle sewn together, but we're gonna do a relaxing incision on the outside. And then that allows the midline to come back together again, that reinforced with the mesh underneath it really um, kind of prevents that hernia from coming back if appropriately, uh, if a mesh is placed appropriately wide enough, et cetera. Um, and so, because uh, uh, with hernias that are left long-term, you end up, that opening will continue to get larger and larger. You have the muscles on the lateral part of the abdomen continuously pulling, trying to pull the midline apart. And then certainly if you opened up the zipper at the midline with hernias, that will continue to widen over time. And then the longer or the wider it is, the more difficult it is to bring the edges back together again or fix a hernia. So in, in that setting, that's where some of these procedures I would do only open operations. I wouldn't do them laparoscopically because it became very challenging. It was very difficult to do this stuff laparoscopically. Robotics has really allowed me to do what in the past I had uh, reserved for open operations. And then you worry about wound infection and prolonged recovery, et cetera. Now I can do all these minimally invasive uh, with the use of the robot. This is just the layers of the abdominal wall where um, it kind of shows that the mesh is placed above uh, the inner lining of the abdomen within the layers of the abdominal wall. Um, hiatal hernia. So something about a hiatal hernia. What a hiatal hernia is a weakness um, in the opening of the diaphragm where the esophagus comes down into the, into the abdomen. Um, so think of it like an upside down horseshoe and the esophagus kind of coming through the upside down horseshoe. What a hiatal hernia is, is that opening in the diaphragm widens to the point where then the whole stomach starts getting sucked up into the middle of the chest. Um, and what that does is, is uh, cause symptoms of reflux, regurgitation. Um, people wake up in the middle of the night because the gastric contents, they're breathing it in and making them cough and have respiratory problems, shortness of breath, their voices get hoarse, et cetera. Um, so uh, robotics has allowed me to do uh, this operation, this fix, we're essentially pulling the stomach back down into the abdomen, sewing the diaphragm and uh, kind of creating a knuckle around the top of the stomach to prevent it from going back in again and preventing the acid to going upwards um, and then correcting that problem of uh, hiatal hernia. So this procedure used to be an open procedure where it would involve a thoracic surgeon making an incision in the chest and a general surgeon with an incision of the abdomen and kind of meeting in the middle and, and fixing the diaphragm, pushing everything back into the belly. Um, certainly the, doing this minimally invasive with uh, laparoscopic techniques is something that I had done at a training. Uh, but then once I started getting into robotics, uh, this, this, this truly showed me at first the clear advantage of the capability of the robot in terms of sewing and manipulation of the tissue and dissection of the tissue planes, et cetera. But hiatal hernia is, every, so I would say most of us have a hiatal hernia of some degree. And for the most part, it's not really uh, bothersome. Occasionally you may have to take a Prilosec or a Tums or something like that. If you get more than about a third or more of your stomach that starts drifting upwards into the, uh, the middle of the chest, that's when you really start recognizing the symptoms listed there where you start having uh, food come up hours after you've uh, ingested it or the acid kind of going into the vocal cords and making you cough or constantly clearing your throat, uh, et cetera. Um, and it's, and I, love, I love surgery for, the, for one of the mere facts that it's very gratifying in seeing how quickly you can make a patient uh, better. Uh, so for hiatal hernias in particular, where some patients are miserable and then, you know, the day after surgery, recognizing that there's no more heartburn reflux, um, there's no more hoarseness of their throat. And then certainly as the healing process occurs, 
recognizing that, yeah, I don't need to take my Prilosec anymore, my uh, different uh, remedies for my, uh, my reflux, et cetera. So, so yeah, so hiatal hernia is a, another big part of what I do. And certainly robotics has enabled me to do this uh, more efficiently and with patients uh, recovering a lot faster. Um, I would say with hiatal hernia repair, um, it used to be that we would keep the patients in for or overnight or a couple of two or three days after surgery. As time went on and recognizing that patients did so well, uh, nowadays, uh, I would say yeah, maybe about 60% of the people will, will go home the same day of surgery. Um, some of that is driven by insurance, believe it or not, where insurance companies will tell me uh, as I'm trying to certify their procedure um, that they won't pay for an operation that uh, involves that patient being in the hospital longer than uh, an outpatient procedure. Uh, so then we kind of do things to try to um, bend the rules a little bit, but certainly um, there are indications where patients need to stay in the hospital overnight, et cetera, afterwards. Uh, but anyway, it's my little spiel on hiatal hernia. Um, I'm going to move on to some videos. I don't know if you guys are interested or not, but I'll say yes. So if I see you put your hands in front of your eyes, just peek with your finger through your fingers and you'll be able to see some of this stuff. So this is an inguinal hernia and these are the robotic instruments inside of it. And it's the large intestines that's kind of poking into the hernia on the left side. And so as I start moving these instruments around and you know, you can recognize that I'm, I have intentional movement. I can, there's a flow to what I'm doing um, I'm kind of understanding uh, the tissue that I'm grabbing. And then certainly as I uh, start loosening up the tissue here, uh, this is electrocautery on the tips of the scissors, kind of kind of help relieve some of the scarring that's developed from this car chronic hernia. Uh, and then uh, moving on uh, with that, I'm just gonna kind of fast forward things. Well, a little bit as I get to where I finally have kind of reduced the intestines or the colon in the hernia. And then, um, and then beyond that, move on to repair that hernia. So that, again, this is an inguinal hernia. This opening here is where the inner tubing, <laughs> the inner tube of the tire starts protruding through a weakness in the tire. Um, this is a, uh, another technique where I use, um, uh, uh, behind the muscle of the abdomen, uh, kind of uh, uh, getting behind the uh, abdominal wall. So certainly this is sped up, obviously, but kind of taking the, the lower tendon of the abdomen, um, peeling it away from the muscle itself. Uh, and then as I, as I move forward in that dissection, um, crossing over to the middle. So this is the, this is the muscle of the abdomen that runs from the ribs down to the pubis. And now here I'm crossing the tendon that encases that muscle to the middle where I meet the natural fatty tissue that uh, sits on the anterior abdominal wall. Inside of here is going to be a hernia. And I, I'm going to move forward a little bit more as I continue. So the hernia bit of it is over here and I'm just creating a space where I'm going to, it's going to allow me to uh, kind of visualize above and below where the hernia is. And so you can see the defect here. This was a belly button hernia that was uh, stuck with this uh, fatty tissue inside of it. Um, and so at the, what happens at the end of uh, all that, which I don't know if I can jump to it at the end, but let me try. Uh, where I bringing a, uh, a sheet of mesh, this is, this is where it's kind of rolled up. Uh, and then I uh, manipulate it to uh, kind of get my instruments in there and unroll it to set it in place. Um, to not bore you too much with all of this stuff, kind of show you what the end result is. Um, where it kind of lays in that uh, plane after I've closed the hole, kind of lay this uh, thin polyester mesh in place. And as you see, it kind of sticks in place because um, it has like a Velcro property to it. And then the last bit of that is then uh, closing um, 
uh, the, the opening that I've created to get into that space. And so what happens here then is that that barrier that prevents the intestines from uh, touching the mesh uh, because now it's within the abdominal wall. Uh, and so that will be a point where um, patients will have a less likely episode of uh, erosion of mesh into uh, uh, the intestines, et cetera. So let me move on to a different, I gotta go back to my slides here. Yeah, Dr. Savone, um, I, I thought it was just me, but um, we lost some of that video. So maybe go back to the slides. Oh. Yep. I just have to find the slides. <laughs> there we go. No, I, I still see the blue. Yeah, okay. Uh, and now I've lost my... Uh, Slideshow. <laughs> All right. So let me see. So here we are back again. Um, so I'm assuming you see this now, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I was, I was basically talking to myself for those last pictures. Sorry about that. <laughs> but here's a, here's another procedure where, um, kind of get in within the layers of the abdominal wall. Uh, and then as you see the robotic instruments kind of flexing and, and wristing and allowing me to, to create a situation where I can get within the layers. So it's as if I had my hands in there uh, microscopically and, and starting to create these, uh, these tissue planes. So let me uh, kind of move this forward a little bit. Um, as I strip that inner lining of the abdomen down from the abdominal tendon, uh, creating this uh, pocket where I moved on to the other side over here. Let me just get to the point where I'm assuming you can see my um, cursor. This would be where the hernia is in the middle um, of the abdomen that I've already pulled the fatty tissue outside of it. So I've created this sort of pocket or shelf uh, through which I'll then uh, place a mesh in between it after closing the um, uh, incision. So let me get to that point where uh, I think the mesh is coming in and then, and then I unroll it and I lay it flat in this area to try to create that patch on the inside of a tire, so to speak. Um, there's a, here's a little video. I just want to talk about lysis of adhesions. So, uh, when, if you've ever heard a surgeon say, Hey, there's a lot, there was a lot of scar tissue on the inside. Uh, most people don't really understand what that means. Um, so particularly after surgery, um, any inflammatory process that occurs on the abdominal wall, uh, will create a stickiness that whatever abuts against it will stick to it. And then certainly that can lead to a situation where everything becomes stuck to the abdominal wall. So the yellow is the fatty tissue overlying the intestines uh, and everything is just kind of stuck. This person has a hernia that's in this location here that I have to get to. So it takes a little while to get to that. This is intestines that's significantly stuck to the anterior abdominal wall. So doing this laparoscopically uh, can be very challenging. Certainly doing this robotically, what I can see there, the definition of the tissue planes, et cetera, really allows me to do some things that uh, otherwise uh, would be very difficult. And certainly uh, the complication that can happen here is that you cut the intestines or you injure the intestines. And then certainly that creates a situation where you wouldn't be able to fix the hernia, but rather, you'd have to fix the intestines and then potentially move to an open operation. So uh, robotics has really kind of allowed me to do some of this stuff that um, uh, otherwise uh, laparoscopically would prove to be really difficult. So if you ever hear a surgeon talk about adhesions and scar tissue on the inside, 
this is kind of what it is, uh, you know, thinking of, of like a bird's nest of trying to separate the twigs and without breaking them and so forth, but certainly it's all soft tissue stuff. So some, some things that happen after hernia repair, we talk about pain and some of that stuff is because of the various, uh, when we do this stuff laparoscopically is using the tacks and so forth around it. Um, having the ability to peel the layers apart and put mesh into there without having to tack it and so forth really kind of translates into a lot less discomfort afterwards. Uh, I'm getting close to the end of my discussion here. So this is just a CAT scan of a patient's abdomen. And as you see, sort of like the mushroom cloud um, of the intestines bursting out of this patient's abdomen uh, because of a big uh, hernia that's uh, developed in the middle of the abdomen. Uh, this is a side view of the same patient as uh, you'll recognize the abdominal wall here, the muscles of the abdominal wall, and then you'll see a big gap as this hernia or big mushroom cloud kind of develops. Certainly this, this is extreme stuff. So this patient, um, I would say uh, six, seven years ago, um, would have been uh, repaired only with an open operation. Um, uh, Currently, I fix all of these uh, using minimally invasive techniques uh, in reconstructing the abdominal wall, being able to peel the layers apart, uh, bringing everything back together again, placing, uh, closing everything together, placing mesh in between the layers. Um, and for somebody like this with this big hernia, if it was an open operation, it would be uh, maybe a seven to 10 day stay in the hospital where doing this robotically, it's a two to three day stay in the hospital uh, afterwards. Um, uh, I, I talked about uh, the American Hernia Society Quality Collaborative, and this is a, uh, the American Hernia Society uh, has surgeons kind of gather information and collectively kind of develop best practices and so forth. That little dot on the east end of Long Island is me. Um, and I think still currently to this day, I'm the only one that, con that uh, contributes to uh, the American Hernia Society in terms of data, et cetera. Um, and then uh, that brings me to the end of my discussion. So I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I'll have a question for you. Anybody know where this is? No? Yeah, this is looking out of the parking lot from Eastern Long Island Hospital into the, into the creek there. Yep. So, all right, I'm happy to answer any questions, anything I can help discuss. I, I have a question. Um, the infant hernia situations, do most parents get it fixed or? Yeah, it's technically not advised that as they're an infant, but rather uh, waiting for at least a year uh, or so, because a lot of that will uh, reduce on its own. Um, if it still uh, remains after that, I mean, it could be a congenital thing where the muscles fail to, to uh, form altogether or the intestines fail to enter the abdominal, in, in the intra-abdominal cavity and some of the intestines are still on the outside. But it's generally uh, after a year's time that the pedi pediatric surgeons would uh, fix that. Yeah. you have a question? Yes. We'll see. Oh, let's, let's hear your question. Yeah. Yes, thank yeah. you. Okay, Doctor, uh, I have a question. Ed. Okay. No. Okay. Do, right, do you John, mention you, you inflate the abdomen? Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. During the, uh, I guess, robotic or oscopic, you inflate the abdomen. Does that have any impact? Yeah. I have COPD. Is that an adverse uh, uh, problem with, uh, so, with this, the operation? Sometimes because, uh, well, while you're under anesthesia, you're also on a ventilator. So during the operation, it does not. Um, certainly you worry about what's called barotrauma, uh, causing too much distension of the lungs and then they pop like a balloon sort of thing. But there are different gauges that kind of measure the pressure of, of the lung uh, compliance as you do that. Um, but during the procedure, uh, it, it's not so much during the procedure that, that that potentially can be a contraindication, but it's the recovery afterwards. How, how well are you gonna be able to take deep breaths 
and um, adequately ventilate uh, after the surgery with abdominal surgery in itself. Um, uh, most of what's used in the operation of inflating the abdomen gets suctioned out, um, but still you, there may be little trickles of air bubbles that, so to, so to speak, that are, that are there that eventually over a course of a few days or so kind of uh, disappear. Um, but for patients with uh, severe COPD, uh, we, we do a pre-op workup where we want to know what your lung capacity is. And uh, we know uh, with pulmonary function tests, as you've probably undergone a pulmonary function test, um, uh, how well you're able to blow out at a force for a prolonged period of time. We measure that uh, in how many liters of air you can expel for, for a period of time. Um, and then that kind of helps us. That's probably the greatest predictor of how well you're going to do post-operatively. So pre-operatively, depending on um, your situation, you'll we'll have you see a pulmonologist to kind of understand the risk of uh, anesthesia with that. Uh, certainly, there are contraindications to doing um, uh, minimally invasive operations on the abdomen, and I would say severe COPD is probably one of them, as well as uh, bad hearts. So heart and lung uh, uh, potentially can be contraindications to inflating the abdomen, general anesthesia uh, altogether. But a lot of that is assessed beforehand Jesus. to get that idea. Is the alternative to uh, then do it with local with a open uh, procedure? Yeah, so it, it depends. For groin, for groin hernias in particular, we can kind of numb up the area enough uh, where uh, I could, I could uh, even do this under pure local anesthesia, uh, can create an inguinal block where we numb up the nerves that uh, innervate that area. Um, and, and so you're breathing on your own, you're, you're kind of just laying there, recognizing that there's a little bit of pressure that's going on, but not really feeling the pain uh, from doing the procedure, from doing the incision and, and dissection and so forth. Yeah, so that's an open hernia technique, but yeah, so the, again, if, it, if, if, the, if there's a contraindication to doing general anesthesia because of heart or lung issues, uh, then open operation uh, would be the uh, next, uh, next best thing. And then aside from a local anesthesia at the site, um, you can do spinal anesthesia also, uh, where it kind of numbs you from the chest downwards uh, just sort of uh, like uh, epidurals that women do when they have uh, C-sections uh, in delivering babies. And would that then be with the uh, robotic or would that be open? And that would be open. Yeah. Okay. So, ro okay. so robotic, ro robotic and laparoscopic involve general anesthesia and inv involve inflating the abdomen um, while the patient's under general anesthesia uh, the patient's on a ventilator, the, the muscles are relaxed. Um, and so that allows for the compliance of the, of the muscles of the abdomen in order for us to do that. If, if there's a contraindication to general anesthesia, COPD, severe COPD, not all COPD, but severe lung disease or severe heart disease. Yeah. Then, and if we had to do something, then it would be an open operation. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I had, um, Two questions, but more, the first one, most important, um, that um, the uh, my GP says that I have, you know, I have a small protruding, yeah, and that I really need to get it done. A proctor, say I came to you like tomorrow. What's the prep time before I'd be able to see surgery? Yeah, so currently, um, uh, I would say probably late December, or early January. So if you came to me, if you came to me tomorrow, say, and uh, we went ahead and scheduled things, uh, yeah, it would be that. Just because I, I have a, I have a, again, I operate two to three times a week, and and the schedule is kind of set right now how how things are. But this it's a dynamic schedule, so patients will have to. Uh, so patients may cancel at times, or they may not pass through certain clearance and that will delay things. And then an opening set opens up and then potentially uh, put you, get you in quicker and so forth. But for right now, I usually book about a, a month to a month and a half out. Okay. But it's just uh, the timing. 
and the back the backlog that you have. It's not so much of having what you have. Like I have, as the gentleman said, I have COPD, I have uh, borderline diabetes, and obesity. Yeah. So 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 we recognizing that as I, as I interview in the office uh, or you or whomever I may not be you or what have you. Um, recognizing that there are different clearances that we'll have to go through. So certainly your GP would be uh, one of the main ones because they would uh, understandably know you the best. Um, if you have a cardiologist, um, I would have the input of the cardiologist kind of tell us about um, you know what, what our risk factors are to your heart. If you've had a stress test recently, if your heart's fine because you've had a, you know, a bypass in the past or stents placed, et cetera. Um, as well as um, you know how your lungs are. So if, if somebody came in and they and I, I know they're on home oxygen and they had and they have COPD where uh, they get pretty winded even just walking up a few stairs and so forth. That kind of gives me an idea of their exercise tolerance, and so we'll go through the clearance again, including the pulmonologist. Um, and so it'll it'll involve uh, your primary care physician your cardiologist, uh, your pulmonologist, if that's somebody, or if there's another specialty that you see, your, your kidney doctor in case you're somebody who has kidney failure. I will say this, uh, over the years, I recognize that uh, we all procrastinate and we all uh, don't necessarily follow through. So I make it a point that uh, when patients come to see me, I have my office set up every single appointment. I know when you're gonna be at an appointment and I know if you don't make an appointment so that it kind of uh, tees it up for us to call you and say, hey, what's going on? And can we follow up? You got this appointment and so forth. And so there's a number of there's a, there's a bunch of uh, F, uh, chances for dialogue between uh, mm -hmm. my uh, surgical coordinators and patients uh, and myself to kind of make sure that all the steps are followed uh, in leading up to it. So I don't, I try not to send patients home with a piece of paper and say, all right, call this guy, make an appointment and call that doctor and make an appointment. No, when you leave the office, uh, you either have all those appointments made for you or the next day they're going to be made for you. And then we'll, we'll talk to you about it. Okay. The second one is not so serious, but uh, it's still, I was thinking of when you were saying this in the near future, with the AI and um, the automation. My question would be, and it seems silly, but would who would be billing you? The, the doctor <laughs> or the robot? The robot. <laughs> well, there go, the order of the so robot. Yeah, there's got to be somebody behind the, ro the robot. So I don't know if, uh, if you've ever seen the movie Prometheus. Prometheus was supposed to be the precursor movie that came after Alien. It was the, the Alien movies that uh, Sigourney Weaver was in and so forth. So anyway, in, in Prometheus, um, there's, one, there's one part of the, of the movie where she realizes, the main character realizes she's been impregnated by an alien. And so she wants it out, obviously, and so forth. So she runs to the ship and she jumps on the surgical table and programs into the table, remove foreign body. And so she lays on the table, a scan is, uh, a, a CAT scan is done or some sort of scan is done that creates a 3D anatomy. Um, the, the robotics part of the surgical table recognizes where the alien is, administers anesthetic, makes the incision, knowing the anatomy based on the three-dimensional CAT scan or whatever was done beforehand, uh, takes it out and then closes her up and so forth. And so I can see that as time goes on, yeah, some of these algorithms happen now, for instance, with uh, some of the brain surgery, there are uh, uh, brain surgery robotics where a three-dimensional scan is produced that kind of recognizes where in the brain, the depth of, of the tissue that their tumor may be and so forth. And so that after you make the incision and put the instruments in place, it knows how deep into the brain tissue does it have to go to find this mass? What are the dimensions of it? Where does it need to go? Right now it guides the surgeon into those, that, bit, that technical bit of taking whatever they're going out, uh, going after out. 
but I can see that something's being automated with time. Again, uh, same thing for liver tumors. There's there's uh, there's the ability to um, do a scan of a liver tumor in the midst of a dense liver, um, uh, creating a scan, uh, kind of understanding the measurements and the contour of the abdomen, so that when the surgeon's at the point of looking at the liver, whether robotically, laparoscopically, or open techniques, um, you superimpose the image of the of the scan. And uh, with some of the algorithms and robotics, it kind of guides where in the depth, where to make your incision, how to avoid the little blood vessels in between uh, the liver and so forth to go after the tumors. So I think with time, yeah, some of this stuff will, will happen and probably become uh, automated. Okay, thank you. But not now. <laughs> <laughs> I worry about one thing at a time. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? You can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. You should be able to uh, unmute yourself if you'd like. Um, you mentioned one with um, acid reflux and you know the one with the stomach part. Yep, the hiatal, you, hiatal hiatal, hiatal, yeah. Right. How do you identify? Let's say a person has a lot of um, acid reflex or has regurgitation, where do you start? Uh, you get a CAT scan, do you get an endoscope or what do you do? First? Yeah, so, so, so at first, at first you would, um, I guess you, you'd likely present to your primary care doc and kind of say, hey, this is going on. And probably one of the first things that happens is, all right, take uh, Prilosec or this medication and come back and see me. Unless you unless it's kind of recognized that, yeah, this is significant. This is something that is more than just a Prilosec or a, a Protonix is gonna take care of. And it the probably the first thing that may end up happening is a referral to a gastroenterologist. Uh, and that uh, will involve then an endoscopy uh, looking inside of the stomach. Uh, another thing that can be done to kind of uh, show this uh, rather quickly is a uh, scan of the chest, the CAT scan of the chest. And then you can kind of recognize some of the structural uh, problems that happen when a hiatal hernia occurs. Um, so, so I think it's at first you, you recognize that, yeah, I'm having this constant reflux, hoarseness, um, I'm regurgitating food, um, shortness of breath where I'm waking up in the middle of the night and I feel like I breathe, I'm drowning because I breathe in my stomach acid as it came up into my chest and so forth. Um, uh, you know, one of the first line of treatment, again, is the antacids that you can take, uh, maybe uh, making sure you don't eat something before you go to bed, uh, so that uh, there's not a lot of food in your stomach, leaving a couple of hours before laying supine, um, and then um, uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, elevate maybe the head of the bed a little bit to have gravity kind of help out with some of that stuff. Uh, but certainly, I think your primary care doc at first, then they'll likely refer you to a gastroenterologist and start you on some medications. Um, and then if it's recognized that uh, whether a CAT scan or by endoscopy, that a lot of your stomach is structurally misplaced, yeah, then, then there's nothing that's going to make that go away other than a, uh, a surgical repair. Well, I, hope I answered if, your question. <laughs> if there are no more questions, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Savone, for joining us tonight on behalf of the South Pole Library. Um, it was very informative and interesting. And uh, I hope everybody has a good night. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this, uh, this kind of worked out. Uh, maybe next time I'll come there physically. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Have a good right. night and happy Thanksgiving. A little bit early, but happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you all. <laughs>